Good afternoon. I'm Paige Winfield Cunningham, health policy reporter and author of the Health 202 newsletter here at The Post. And I'm very pleased to be joined by Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Paige. Glad to be with you. Secretary Azar has spent his career working in both the public and private sectors as an attorney and in senior leadership roles focused on advancing healthcare reform research and innovation. Today we're going to be talking about reducing healthcare costs, a topic you've been very vocal about. I know over the last few months of covering HHS, we'll discuss a range of issues in this vein, from your plans to lower drug prices, advance Medicaid, Medicare payment reforms, and lower, offer lower uh, cost health insurance plans. Um, first, I'd like to spend a couple of minutes on the top line news this week about uh, these migrant children and the administration's zero tolerance policy. And I know we've had some breaking news um, just in the last few minutes even of uh, this order that the president has issued ending his policy. Can you explain, I think there's a lot of questions right now since we've just heard this, can you explain exactly what this policy is and what it means for HHS? Sure, so the new, the new, the new, the new, the new So what we, um, what we do at HHS is we have an unaccompanied children program, and the, the Obama administration had it, the Bush administration before it, set up by statute. And what we do is we take care of any minor children who enter the country uh, unaccompanied, as the, name, as, the name, as the name says, it's for unaccompanied children. And historically, those have been children who have come into the country by themselves, um, or their parents are in another country, have sent them up here. And we run facilities, and they're provided education. They're provided um, athletics each day, entertainment, uh, medical care, dental vision care. Um, and on average, they'll be with us for about 58 days. And what our job is is to work to find them sponsors with whom they'll then be placed. 50% of the time, historically, they're placed with their parents. And about 40% of the time, they're placed with other relatives, and about 10% of the time, uh, non-relative sponsors. So that's the history of, this, of how the program operates. Um, and of course, now with the, with, with the individuals who are entering the country illegally being charged, just like you or me, if we were charged and arrested, our children don't stay with us if we're in jail, um, they then become unaccompanied. And so any children who are coming into the country illegally with their parents were being given to us. The president's order today would say that he, is, he has ordered for the families that come into the country illegally to remain in the care and custody of the Department of Homeland Security and to remain together. So instead of, so at that point, if the parents are not separated and sent to jail, if they're, if they're there in a processing capacity and they remain with their children, the children are not unaccompanied, therefore they don't come to HHS, they're no longer unaccompanied children. So this is basically reverting to the original practice of no, no, it, How is this different? No, it always would have been the case that if, uh, if in the Obama administration or otherwise, that if a child is unaccompanied, they would be sent to HHS right. for care, and unaccompanied could be either because the parent has been arrested for violating the law, or it could be that the child, if, 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 uh, if, if ICE or Customs and Border Patrol determine that even a parent with the child is for some reason the child is in jeopardy, jeopardy or in any way at risk, that child could be then taken and be unaccompanied and given to us also. Those would be other circumstances. But with now the ending of the catch and release policy, so then the individuals who enter the country illegally being charged, the kids become unaccompanied, they would become our, our, in our care. So under the executive order now, the president is ordering that the parents and the kids remain together so they don't, they don't come over to, to our facilities. Okay, so just to be clear then, this influx of children that HHS has been handling, th these children will no longer be placed under your, under your care. Again, that if, if, the, if it's appropriate for them to remain with the parents, if, it, if they're valid, if they confirm their parents, and if there's no safety or jeopardy issue with them remaining with their, their families, then the president has said they, they stay together in DHS care and custody. They wouldn't be unaccompanied, so they don't come to HHS. Okay, and yeah. did you yourself work with the administration on this executive order? Uh, so our, 
we get the children once they're unaccompanied and take care of them. Uh, so immigration policy isn't right, I mean, really what we at HHS do. That would be the Department of Homeland Security working with DOJ and the White House. So you didn't have any input into the announcement the president just So our, what, what we do is we, if we get kids, uh, the unaccompanied children, we, we work to take care of them. Um, so what does this mean then for, for HHS? I know that we have, you have several thousand kids that have been placed into your, into your custody and there's been a lot of talk this week about what's happening to them. What does this mean now? Are you gonna be starting today, this week, next month to try to reunify them? What does that mean for those kids? So, um, so the vast majority of the children that we have in the unaccompanied children program are these children who come into the country totally unaccompanied. So either their parents have sent them here or they have just come of their own volition to the US, they've entered the country, they come into our care, and we work with case management to try to find them sponsors. And as I said, uh, usually it's with family members here in the United States, and we'll keep doing that work with the children who have come to us through the program where their, where their parents have been detained and arrested and charged, and then they're hence unaccompanied, and we'll still be working on the children that we've got to find them appropriate sponsors to get them placed. Okay, but just to be clear on this 2,300 kids that I know that have been separated, I think over the last six weeks or so, um, what specific steps will the agency be taking to reunify these kids? And do you have confidence that you'll be able to have the information to match them with their parents again? Oh, so we, so we keep in touch with the parents. We, even under any circumstance, are working to be always in touch with the parents to ensure placement with relatives, or if the parents are released, to ensure that they can go to the parents if the parents are appropriate sponsors. If there's no reason why the child would be in jeopardy, we'll keep working to, to place them with appropriate sponsors. But can you offer, I mean, is there any timeline that you have? Is this something that you're going to make a goal of, you know, this next week, the next couple weeks? How long will it take? To well, we, we, we are always working aggressively. We need to get the children out of our care as expeditiously, expeditiously as possible. We're subject to a court order, a consent decree to get them in proper sponsor care as quickly as possible. I said the average is about 58 days. Um, and so we want to we want to get them with appropriate sponsors as quickly as we can. I also want to ask you about a report this week that there were est showing estimates that HHS has lost track of 6,000 kids that were placed with sponsors. Are those numbers accurate? And if so, what is your agency doing about that? So the whole notion of lost track is just a false one, as you've as you've reported. Um, the when we place them with sponsors, our our task set by Congress is for us to place the children with sponsors, usually with a family member. Um, at that point, they are subject to local and state uh, child welfare protection procedures. We aren't running a national child welfare, uh, child protective services. They're then placed with appropriate individuals, appropriate sponsors, um, and at that point, they're in the system and they're subject to local and state systems for that. We're not running a national child welfare system. Um, we have had a practice of calling at the 30-day mark the sponsors to just check to see do they need anything, is everything okay, Any, you know, can we be helpful, and sometimes they don't answer the phone. That's the report. The numbers you're citing are the sponsors who don't answer the phone, and if we leave a message, don't call us back. That was just, it was a check-in call, do you need anything from us, is everything okay? Okay. They're not in our jurisdiction. We can't pull them back. They're under state and local laws. They're with sponsors and in custody locally. So what does Trump's They're order lost. What does Trump's order today mean then for the plans that I know you had talked about the last couple of weeks to increase capacity mm -hmm. and I believe you were trying to hire more workers to care for these young children. What what changes now about that? Well, so we did, the executive order was just signed, so we'll be working on the implementation planning to see in terms of moving forward. I would suspect we'll still keep moving forward. It's always good to have good contingency plans and make sure we have adequate capacity there to take care of the, take care of the children. So we were working on, on additional capacity, and I think we'll still keep working to ensure that we have flexible capacity. Uh, we tend to get more unaccompanied children generally, and we are already seeing this during the spring and summer months. That's just historic trend, and so we always are looking to make sure we've got adequate adequate and appropriate capacity for it. But does this mean yes. you don't need to go ahead with some of those hiring plans and those plans to open more of these like tent, semi-permanent tent facilities and that sort of thing? Well, as I said, I, the executive order was just signed, so we'll be working on that to determine what our needs are in light of that. Um, we have a regular flow. The vast majority of the kids that we get are children who come into the country unaccompanied, um, totally unaccompanied, and we have to take care of them, and we need the capacity. So We'll have to assess what our needs are there. That number has been on the rise, again, be, because 
um, because of the need to change our immigration laws. I and mean, we, we need Congress to act to change our immigration laws. We are still getting these kids coming into the country. And if they come in unaccompanied as minors, they're going to come to us, and we've got to we've got to have the capacity to take care of them. And do you support this policy change? Is it, is it something you think is a good good order that the president issued? So uh, we nobody has ever desired to separate families. The if but it, just like for you or me. Uh, if you are arrested, your kids aren't going to be with you. Okay, that's why the message I've said, the Attorney General, the Homeland Security Secretary have been saying is, if you want to remain with your children, don't, don't come across the border illegally because if you're arrested, if you're stopped, you're going to be arrested, you're going to be charged, your children will then be separated from you as they would be for you or me if we were arrested. Okay? So present yourself at a legal border crossing, make your case if you have a case to make, hopefully you already have a visa, come across the legal way or present to make any claim that you're going to make for legal entry into the country in that setting. Don't come across illegally because you'll be separated from your children. Now with this change, um, the kids will be able to stay with their parents while they're adjudicated and while they're either prosecuted or adjudicated for deportation proceedings. And last question on this, um, have you visited any of these facilities where indeed. they were kept? Yep. When, where and when? Uh, I'm not going to disclose the particular facility. I think it's not, I think it's not good that we have been having so much, at, so much attention focused on them and that can actually subject our children to risk. I don't want to do that. Um, I have, in fact, recently been to facility and they, um, as I said, the children are, these, these grantees who take care of these children have a deep passion and sense of mission for caring for these kids. I mean, it is, uh, they are out in the child welfare business to make sure that these kids are well cared for. They are case managing to try to get them placed with appropriate sponsors. They're providing them with education. They get medical, dental, vision medical and psychological care and counseling. They're getting their meals. They have athletics every day. Um, so the, we, we believe we're doing our best to care for these children extremely well. Uh, so, I mean, do you feel as though you've been treated unfairly by, there's been a lot of criticisms charged in the last couple of weeks about how these children are kept? I think once uh, members of Congress have actually, the ones who've actually visited, the, visited facilities and toured it as opposed to those who are simply talking about it, um, I think they've been impressed by, again, by our grantees, the level of care and the quality of services provided to these children. I mean, it's, uh, um, we're doing it under a consent decree, so there's court monitoring, and uh, I think we do it quite well, and we take the mission quite seriously. Okay. Well, this is about health care costs, so let's turn to that um, for a few minutes. Um, I wanted to start off asking you about your efforts with uh, Medicare payment reform, because this is something I remember covering a lot under the Obama administration, and they had set out a goal of tying half of Medicare's payments to alternative payment models uh, by the end of this year, actually. Is that a goal that HHS is still pursuing? So um, I actually was just meeting with uh, the head of our Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation just today at lunchtime where we were talking about the precise question. We, we want to formulate what our actual goal is for value-based transformation, what our metrics will be for, as I would say, X to Y by when, what would be the, uh, the actual con concrete metrics there. I'm not sure that simply being in an alternative payment model, which was the metric the Obama administration used, is the one that I would find to be... Um, substantive and real in terms of transformation of our healthcare system. What I don't want to do is have is have an approach where it's it's a tag the base, hit a scorecard number, as opposed to I, we genuinely want to revolutionize how healthcare is paid for in this country in an outcome based, um, health based, non procedure, non sickness based way. Um, we were working on that, and that's where we're trying. We want to get to real concrete metrics. I'm just not sure, as much as I appreciate the efforts of both the Bush administration and the Obama administration in driving, continuing this bipartisan drive towards value-based transformation, I'm not sure that's the metric I want to adopt as the measure of success. Then what should the metrics be? Well, again, that's what we're working on. Okay. <laughs> I'll let you know as soon as we get it figured out. Paige, I'll tell you first, okay? <laughs> Please tell the health to it too first. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Um, but are you going to, so, okay, so that aside though, are you going to set any specific goals or Absolutely. time frame? Yes, we will. I mean, that's how we lead. That's how we execute. We will 
but first we need to we're working on the we're working on the concrete strategy for Center for Medicare Medicaid innovation uh, that will also have dimensions for what we're doing within the fee for service program and Medicare Advantage around moving towards value based payment arrangements also for what we're doing in our Center for Safety and Quality at Medicare and Medicaid and for what we're doing at the Austin National Coordinator for Health IT because interoperable health IT is of course a critical element of that but we're we've got an agenda that lays out four critical areas of change the first is um, genuine interoperable health information technology. The second is transparency. Uh, the third is using the Medicare and Medicaid programs to drive fundamental transformation within the healthcare system, including in the commercial space. We're the biggest payer in the world, uh, and we want to drive that change. And then the fourth is removing any kind of government or artificial barriers to integrative, collaborative care, which is actually what you need to be able to deliver that kind of outcome-based care. Right. and payment. But as you know, I mean, so there's a lot of talk about alternative payment mm -hmm. models and people's eyes glaze over. Um, and there has been, I think some would argue, less progress in that direction mm -hmm. than maybe many had hoped. Yep. Why? Well, this, this is, listen, we're talking about changing $1.1 trillion of spending in the United States just within government programs alone and one-seventh of the economy. That doesn't happen overnight. And I think what the, the Bush administration, which Secretary Levitt, who started this, and then the, the continued efforts in the Obama administration were um, our important foundational efforts. So, I mean, we will build on that. I think we are at the hockey stick moment, though. I do believe that that we will, with bold leadership and willingness to, frankly, as the president allows us to disrupt the status quo, actually hit a hockey stick moment of fundamental transformation in how, in, in how we pay. Um, I think you know, we have already declared patient ownership of their interoperable health information, that when they show up, that should be theirs, and the metric will be, is, it actual, is their health information there when they arrive, no matter what the provider is, removing the barriers and having them be the, the, the owner of that information, not the physician, not the hospital, but their ownership, and providing vehicles like OpenAPI to enable apps to suck up that data and be able to be genuinely putting the patient in the driver's seat of that. Um, transparent information about price and quality. We've already put proposals in our fee-for-service regulations, and I think that's just the tip of the iceberg of where we need to and will go in terms of mandating requirements around price and, trans trans and, uh, and, qual and quality transparency for, for patients. Through CMMI and otherwise, we will use our full authorities to drive change. Um, I imagine, a, <clears throat> I mean, we, we just put out, a, you know, we'll, we'll be putting out today information around Stark um, asking for comment about how we can how we can improve Stark um, restrictions that prevent again um, integrative care because what I wanted one of the things I think one of the flaws of past approaches was that they they incented common ownership okay um, so because of the regulatory burdens around Stark and anti kickback the easiest way around that was to actually have common ownership to vertically and horizontally integrate. And I'm not sure bigger is always better, um, as opposed to collaborative can be done virtually. I'd like to make sure that we're agnostic to ownership structures, let economics actually drive that, not our payment systems or our regulatory environment. And could we have virtual teams? Could we, could we put a procedure out to bid in the market and not just an integrated hospital system be the integrator, but perhaps a physician practice group be the in integrator from diagnosis through rehab of a procedure? I want to make sure that whole, whole scale is available. I want to step back for a minute and ask you a broader question about U.S. healthcare spending. So, as you know, it's 17.9 percent of GDP projected to grow to 19.7 percent of GDP by 2026. Do we need to stem this growth? And is it even possible to identify like what 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 percentage of GDP should healthcare spending in the U.S. Be? Listen, I I don't know that there's an objectively right amount of <clears throat> of a percent of GDP spending that ought to go to healthcare. And frankly, that's a, the aggregation of individual value choices about um, wanting a you know a garage on one's house versus uh, versus a type of medical care and that aggregates up to a system but what I do know is we're paying twice as much as say the British okay for health care we get great health care in the United States make no mistake about it but is it twice as good I don't think so okay so there is there are absolutely we're, we have a procedure based sickness based system that it, it incents it incents more medical care it doesn't necessarily incent outcome based health delivering care. Um, so 
is it too much? It, yes, it's too much. We want to drive that percent down. We want to drive costs down across the full spectrum of, of services and products in our system. Um, what I don't, again, I don't buy into the notion there's an objective number, but I objectively know it's too high just looking at good benchmarks. And it seems like your job um, is especially challenging because we have such a patchwork system here. I mean, compared to other developed countries, we have a whole patchwork system of insurance. You can pull levers with Medicare and Medicaid, but that's only part of you know coverage for the fraction of the U.S. population or percentage. Um, so is, I mean, it like how far can can you go on your own in moving the needle as well? So it's it, it it's a fair point, um, but. I think that the challenge for us on driving change is offset by the patient being at the center of the system. You know, the, the difference in economic speak is, is exit rights. Um, the genius of our system is that for the most part, patients have choice, and if patients don't like what their insurer is a key aggregator in the system, the choices that insurers make, they can, they can often choose a different insurer, and that is a check in the system. In other countries that have a single payer system, the check is only the political mechanism or revolution. Um, I made that statement once at a speech in China, and I said, <laughs> like, oops. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, it, uh, I mean, that, that is the check on the system, whereas here, picking a different insurance company um, is, is the check. And it, yes, it makes my job more difficult, but of course, we have, through Medicare, the largest payer on earth. Um, that is where we have through the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, as well as just our payment regulations and the flexibilities that we have and the discretion that we have, the ability to drive, I think, fundamental change. Um, let's make no mistake about it. Our healthcare delivery system is in many respects frozen in time from the mid-1960s with an update in the early 1980s. Um, that really tracks Medicare, okay? We, uh, I don't think it's coincidental that the creation of first the Medicare system as, a large, as the largest payer on a cost-based reimbursement system, followed by a prospective payment fee-for-service model in the early 80s, then froze in place a system. You know, if you look at provider contracts with insurance companies, for the most part, they're, they're simply, they're rather simple documents. They're written 120% of Medicare fee-for-service. That's the contract. You know, they're free-riding off of the payment regs that we do, or 80% of fee-for-service, whatever. So we, we do drive so much of the system, and so just the ability to change Medicare, I think, will provide the critical mass in the system. Because uh, look, e even if you're a major payer, in many markets, as company as big as a United, as big as, a, as an Anthem or an Aetna, they may have two, three, four percent penetration in a market. And so to be the first mover and actually drive fundamental change in, in, in of the relationship with a major hospital system, they don't have actually necessarily have the market power to do that. We do through Medicare. I want to talk about drug prices mm -hmm. now because I know that's a lot of what you've been working on in the last few months. Um, and you know, there seems to be widespread agreement, regardless of which party you talk to, that prices are just too high. Um, but the disagreement starts over whose fault it is, mm -hmm. I think. Who along the supply chain is most to blame for high drug prices? I don't think it's productive to try to say most to blame. Listen, at the at the I was core, the, to pin at you the, down well, there. at the four, <laughs> well, listen, at the, who sets their drug price? The drug company sets their drug price. So, in the first instance, the drug the drug company's to blame for the price they set. That's the that's they're setting the price. Okay, nobody's controlling that. But then there is. It's a very very strange system that we have. Just the way contracts have gotten written over the last couple of decades in the channel that every single player in that channel, drug company, pharmacy benefit manager, and, and wholesale distributor, makes more money, given how the contracts are written, on a higher list price. And as the list price goes higher, they make more money. They will lose money with a lower list price. And we're facing that today because we have, as I've said, we've had several major companies with major products um, reveal to us that they are looking at and want to make substantial and material cuts in their list prices of their, of their drugs. Um, they are facing challenges working through these contractual arrangements so that they're not put at an instantaneous competitive disadvantage by having a lower price. Um, because the way contracts are written is a, to, for remuneration is a percent of that list price, I think it'll work out. I think it is such a good thing if list prices can be lower 
that the players in the system, I think the major employers and the major insurance companies, including the folks who were just sitting here before us, um, I think will demand that everyone figure that out. They're adults. They can figure this out. Contracts can be written and reformulated to make this work. It's good for pay and it's good for patients. Um, that's voluntary action. Uh, but of course, we have a comprehensive, I think, revolutionary agenda for driving that to happen. So I'm not, listen, if, if they do it on their own, that's great. They've heard the message. The president's made it clear where this system's going. Like Wayne Gretzky, they, they can skate to where the puck is going. Great. But that puck is going there, and the rest of our agenda is, drive, is to drive it there. So does this necessarily mean getting rid of, re would you advocate for actually getting rid of rebates? And how can you do that within your, your capacity? So I, I have said before that I believe that under the anti-kickback anti statute, which created the rebate safe harbor for pharmacy benefit managers, that what one creates, one can take away. Um, I think that that is a reasonable and appropriate response. Uh, we need to look at that. There are complexities there. We would need, we would want to get comment on that because that is, of course, restructuring an entire segment of the economy and how that works. And you're just um, talking about how this applies to Part D, Part D plans. Uh, primarily, the anti-kickback kickback statute would be Part D, but there, I, I don't want to, I don't want to conclusively state the full reach of our regulatory authority or the import of the anti-kickback statute. So should we be? Well, I wish to be deliberately ambiguous there. Should, <laughs> well, so, but are, are you, t you're taking steps toward that end? You we, said you're looking we into are, it, we, should we? We are indeed working on that. Okay. Looking at how one would move to, as I said, a fixed, disc a fixed price discount model uh, to look at that instead of, in, instead of a rebate model around pharmacy benefit manager pricing. And that's something that could be done through the regulatory process, so it would be a proposed I believe, rule. I believe that's something that we could look at through through rulemaking, of course, through under our authorities in the anti -kick, under the anti-kickback statute. I've said this all publicly before. That's in the blueprint. It's in the president's blueprint that we want to look at and seek comment on uh, moving towards a fixed price discounting model in the pharmacy benefit manager arrangement. We also, importantly, would like to look at banning all remuneration to pharmacy benefit managers from pharma companies. Because right now, if you're a pharmacy benefit manager, you're making money on the rebates that you're getting. You may be holding back a bit of that, again, based on a percent of list price. You're also making money on administrative fees, which again are based as a percent off of list price. And there may, may be other, other remuneration in there. And it, I believe it is a legitimate topic for us to discuss, to discuss and to consider to ban all remuneration from the very entities you're supposed to be banging on to get the best discounts and lowest prices possible, the pharma companies instead receive all of your remuneration on, from the entities who you're serving, your customers. Uh, your boss, President Trump, recently said uh, that there would be quite immediate results from the plan to lower drug prices. Is he overpromising here? How long is it going to take to implement some of these strategies that would then have an effect on the price of drugs? So I'm um, obviously not going to preempt any announcement by the president or otherwise. I did mention to you already that there are many drug companies who would like to lower list prices and do so rather quickly. Um, and they're working through, frankly, the difficulties of the system and the channel. I remain hopeful that the players in, that, in the drug pricing channel uh, we'll all work together to make this happen because it is an undeniable good for patients. Um, but that again is that's part of the plan. Uh, I mean that, that's 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 part of what could deliver lower prices. Um, but we are driving forward on an aggressive agenda that's co that's part of this comprehensive plan. So we've already. But if, have you yeah. yourself talked to drug executives about any announcements they we, might be making? We 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 are working to ensure that we remove any barriers to lowering list prices. If we stand in the way, uh, we want to make sure that we're not standing in the way of any of that. And so we're we're trying to drive that forward because if that happens, that's what we want. We want lower lower drug prices. We want lower list prices. We want better negotiation for drugs through our programs. Uh, we want lower out-of-pocket spending by patients and want more competition. So we've already historic levels of generic drug approval by FDA. We've changed our payment formula in Part B, which is the infusion drugs that save seniors now $320 million a year of their out-of-pocket spending by changing the reimbursement formula there. Um, we have already gone after the abuses by drug companies, the branded drug companies, to prevent generic entry through abuse of these so-called REMS or safety programs. We've spotlighted the companies who were doing it. We've put out guidance making it clear that you cannot hide behind these safety programs to prevent access to your drug, to the generic, to do their quality testing. Um, 
so we're driving we're driving this agenda forward very quickly already one more question on this though and there was a lot of talk about how pharma stocks actually rose up after the trump's drug pricing speech in may and your critics have used this to charge that you're going too easy on drug companies yep. are you uh, almost every sector went up that day, so I don't know that we had any impact on the entire S&P or Dow Jones that day. Um, listen, judging your success or failure on a stock market daily and hourly price uh, variations would be a foolish, a foolish enterprise. The core of our policies are strong. They're, re they're actually revolutionary. We are seeking nothing short of the complete rewiring of the drug pricing and drug reimbursement system in the United States. Nothing short of that. Those who actually know this this is rocket science. This is a very complex area. Those who've actually studied the blueprint say how sophisticated the president's approach is, that this reflects a deep, deep knowledge of how drug pricing, how drug reimbursement, how pharmacy and pharmacy benefit manager negotiation works, and the very odd incentives in that system, and how to get at them in a very micro-targeted way, and that this reflects that. And that's why, frankly, your average stock analyst or other, it's going to be very hard to see the import. Our job is to deliver on it. We'll show you. The proof will be in the pudding of, of results. I want to talk a minute about um, the price of insurance plans. And of course, yesterday we saw the final rule on association health plans. Um, but, you know, I, I have been struck by the number of health industry groups and patient groups that have expressed serious concerns. Um, so if these are such a great idea, why are you seeing such pushback from the industry? Well, listen, I'm sure the concerns are well-founded and well-meaning, but our concerns are also well-founded and well-meaning. We're not only concerned about the people that are in the individual insurance markets, and are they getting quality insurance and insurance that's affordable and not just affordable to acquire, but affordable to use? Is it genuine insurance for the 10 to 11 million people in that individual market? But also, what about the 28 to 29 million people who are now priced out of and are not able to get individual insurance because of the failings of the affordable care market? You know, 86% or so of the people that are in the individual market are being subsidized for their acquisition of insurance by us, okay? What about the people who, whose income puts them just over that limit, the forgotten men and women, 28 to 29 million, they cannot afford this insurance and even if they could afford it, it would make no rational sense for them to buy because it doesn't deliver a product that is financially sustainable. To, have, to, to spend $15,000 for an insurance package that has a $8,000 deductible when you make fifty dollars or $60,000 as a family of four makes no sense for them and they've told us this by their actions as 6.7 million Americans have paid $3.3 billion of the individual mandate tax to not buy insurance that they can't afford and do not want. And so we're trying to make options available for them, whether it's association health plans or short-term limited duration plans. We're trying to give people a range of options and choices. And we do not believe that it undermines that individual market that is already in there because you effectively have a subsidized market. The individual's in there. We're helping them to buy their insurance. And having another option in there is very unlikely, we believe, to draw people from free insurance over to something else. Do you think this will worsen the marketplaces, though, because it will presumably draw healthier people out? And, and I, I don't. I don't believe it will do so in a material way because the people that are in that market right now are subsidized. Okay, These are individuals who are already being subsidized to get it. So why they're going to move from being subsidized to not subsidized and have to buy insurance so for that 80, 84 to 86% of people in that market, I don't see that. I, reasonable minds can differ. Um, I do not see that. I just as a behavioral matter, it makes no sense to me. Because there have been some estimates that, so you know, if you have the sicker people left in the marketplaces, pushes the premiums up, actually causes uh, some population to actually go uninsured because of the prices in the market. You are, that, that is the system we have, and that is exactly why for the entirety of, a, of the Affordable Care Act's history, rates have been going up, and why for the, you know, for the last five years, they've, I think, effectively doubled, is that is exactly the system we have now where you have either people where we're buying their insurance or you have a sick risk pool that's sitting in there um, that that that's there and so you're healthy have left it is the healthy that have left and so you've got healthier younger people that are out of that market they're not there they're not there to leave that market and so a lot of the analytics I think are based on a false behavioral assumption um, they're sitting out there they're uninsured they're doing exactly what I said they're paying they're they're paying a penalty to not buy insurance they don't want and can't afford. 
The other prong of uh, what the, tr the president was pursuing in terms of the leaner, cheaper plans was expanding short-term health plans. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe there was a proposed rule on mm -hmm. that already. Yes. When can we expect the final rule on so that? So we're, we're working as quickly as possible to consider all of the comments and decide on, on issuing a final regulation there through the rulemaking process. So we're moving as expeditiously as we can through that. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's a good non-answer thing. <laughs> um, so in November, you're going to be presiding over your first, uh, the first open enrollment uh, season. Um, and, and as you know, enrollment last year was actually better than, than a lot of folks had predicted, despite some of the cuts to advertising in the navigators. Um, how are you going to approach this year's sign-up season, is your goal to maximize enrollment? Um, you know, what what are your thoughts? Can you share? Well, listen, I've, I've I've been very I was very clear through the confirmation process, and I'm very clear otherwise. Is I, I I do not like the Affordable Care Act. I don't think it's working for people. I think we need a different system that is both sustainable and offers affordable options for individuals who want people in, to have insurance, want them to have affordable insurance. I don't think the Affordable Care Act delivered on that promise. With that being said. I'm the Secretary of Health and Human Services. As long as that program remains on the books, I'm going to faithfully faithfully operate it. I'm going to do so in a way that delivers as good a care as we humanly can for people and as affordable insurance as we can. And we will work to get people enrolled, make sure that they know the options and if and get them enrolled if uh, if it's a pro if it's an offering of interest to them. So we'll be working diligently to make that work. And I think what we showed last year is that there are very efficient ways to target and get people in, as you said, with radically less spending, more efficient spending, uh, especially a program that's now more mature and well known. Uh, we were able, it was the most efficient enrollment season ever. Do you have any goals, though, to exceed enrollment from last year? What would you view as a success? We'd like as many. Well, success for me is people finding that insurance is what they want to is, is that it's affordable, available, and they're and they're and they want to use it. And so, um, if if more people end up finding an offering here that they that they would like, or through the other alternatives that we're able to offer, whether it's association health plans or if we have additional short-term limited duration plans, uh, or any other offerings. Um, it's people getting, finding affordable insurance that we've been able to somehow connect them to. That's success. So you've said that ACA is, is law of the land, um, but do you back DOJ's recent refusal to defend it in court? Of, cor of course I support the Justice Department's conclusions there. Um, again, that's a constitutional and then followed by a statutory argument of just interpretation around sever of whether you sever these other provisions along with, do they have, are they inextric these other provisions inextricably connected? connected to the individual mandate. And I need to remind people, this hasn't been reported on, so you know, big news. Um, the Justice Department's position on severability of the individual mandate is identical to what? The Obama administration's position in the Supreme Court. It is the same position they took in the Supreme Court lit litigation the, around the individual mandate that if you were to strike down the individual mandate, the guaranteed issue and community rating are inextricably connected to the individual mandate and must fall as a matter of statutory interpretation. So again, this is a constitutional statutory judgment by the Attorney General, court filing. Um, that's just a matter of interpreting how the state of play on the statute. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. I'd like to thank Secretary Azar for joining us, and it's been a thank great you, conversation. Great to be with you. Thank you. Thank you all. If you want to watch any interviews from today or past Post Live programs, you can head over to WashingtonPostLive.com. To all our viewers, thanks for tuning in. Great. Thank you, Paige. Excellent.